morning, the rain is replaced with mist, and the guard outside is found decapitated, with his body running around headless while his head still talks, like a cartoon character. Testament to Kunz's writing ability that this guy is actually pretty creepy. Knowing that there are dangers out in the mist, including a child murderer, Molly and Neil decide to head out and rescue the surviving children. Molly recognizes that the animals now seem to have otherworldly intelligence and will obey her, so she selects a dog named Virgil to be her guide. Virgil is named in allusion to the Guide of Hell in Dante's Inferno. They tell the group to hole up in the bank vault, and they'll meet them there later. They face many challenges as they collect the children, including various alien monsters, a church filled with undead parishioners, parish dinners, if you will, and evil humans who want to kill children to gain favor with the aliens, who hate children for some reason, but appear unable to harm them directly. Unlike Signs, where the child characters are important in the plot as active characters, The Taking suffers a similar problem as in Age of Ultron, where there is this strong focus on the importance of adults becoming parents, but not a very flattering portrayal of children themselves. The creators project their fears of sterility onto characters that they honor for wanting to be parents, but neither works have much in the way of child representation, despite a framing that should honor children themselves. Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton better handles its theme about intergenerational relations and the importance of children by having multiple active child characters throughout the whole of the book. I think Michael Crichton can honor children better than Dean Koontz and Joss Whedon. Molly figures out that they're making a flawed assumption that all of the aliens are working toward the same goal. There are, in fact, two factions of aliens. Hostile aliens, which manifest as organic monsters, and benevolent aliens, which manifest as UFOs. They're playing some game with rules. The hostile aliens want to harvest the humans, but only the ones who commit certain transgressions. And they're not allowed to go after the children unless they manipulate humans into hurting them. The benign aliens are manipulating humans suitable as caretakers into rescuing children, and they have made all animals intelligent and compelled them to help the caretakers. Which means that Molly missed the chance to lead a pack of coyotes that she encountered early in the book. Darn. Unlike Halo 3 ODST's homage to Dante's Inferno, most of the taking's obstacles representing the circles of hell do not hold distinct importance because of their subtext and are just general trials for the protagonist to face. But the last one, the boss fight if you will, does feel notable in its homage to the ninth circle of hell. In Inferno, the final, deepest circle of hell is reserved for committers of the worst sin, treachery, and Lucifer himself is there imprisoned suffering alongside humans, being tortured at the same time that he tortures humans himself. He's a force of evil, hated for his sin, while simultaneously fulfilling God's role in a greater plan. This provides the subtext when Molly enters the bank vault to find the adults suspended in an undead state, the children alive, and her father threatening them. Her father is a traitor, someone who she thought she could trust and look up to, who turned out to be a selfish monster threatening her and her child peers. She shot him once before, but now she is seemingly powerless as he forces her to make a Sophie's choice. She can save most of the children, but she'll have to pick which one he'll kill. Which would be more significant if all these children were actually characters that we knew and cared about individually. It's like the difference between one of the seven dwarves will die and Spider-Man has to save the school bus full of children. It's seemingly hopeless, but at her worst moment, the UFOs come to her aid and give her the intuition she needs to challenge her father, whom she figures out is actually dead, meaning that this being isn't really him, just an alien using his form and memories to trick her. He's also Satan, but we'll get to that in a moment. He mutates into a horrific monster, something straight out of the thing, but she holds firm that all of the children are under her protection and tutelage. They were evocative of guardian angels. And he has to back off. At this point, the aliens retreat. All the bad humans are horrifically merged into organic ships of the hostile aliens. Most good humans are taken by the good UFOs. And what remains are caretaker adults and all of the children that manage to survive. 
The caretakers have enough knowledge to restart civilization, but wiser and less violent this time. No more terrorism, as is presumably a result of no more Islam. Molly is effectively rewarded with a bunch of children to look after, which doesn't feel sexist because of the way her issues were described in a relatable way, regardless of gender. In the epilogue, she figures out this was a Noah's Ark deal. The alien taking the form of her father was the devil himself. The other hostile aliens were his demons. And the good aliens were guardian angels. The angels organized the caretakers, and they took good humans into heaven, while the devil tested the caretakers and took the bad humans to hell. Any sufficiently advanced magic is indistinguishable from technology. She figures out the message from the ISS is an English cipher of the devil introducing himself. It doesn't really make sense. He's speaking to the entire world, right? Why would he use English as a starting language, and not an ancient biblical language like Enochian, or a magically understandable language of the birds from the time before the Tower of Babel fell? English isn't a universal language, and if he's going to tailor his message to a specific audience, why use a cipher? She assumes he'd hide his meaning as the Prince of Lies. But why would he tell the truth and obscure the message, instead of lying and saying he's an alien who comes in peace or something? In Signs, the twist works because it's a very personal take on a worldwide disaster, just about how this one family fits into God's plan with recognition of signs of God's presence. When you have a worldwide event that only the protagonist can understand, it makes it seem like she is a savior figure. But it's made clear that she's only one of many, so it doesn't make sense that the message is tailored to her. Maybe Coons was originally going to have her as a singular Noah figure and didn't update the twist when he made her one of many. It's sloppy writing either way, and it gave me a few giggles as I thought about Satan's bizarre calling card. I'm a super powerful being making myself known to the world by speaking in a language that only part of the world will understand and then using a cipher so only a few people who speak the language will be able to understand it. I am the destroyer of worlds. As a religious fantasy, it runs into the pitfall where, by virtue of saying that Christianity is the one true religion, every other religion is false. It handles this as well as it could. Could be a lot cringier than it is, but the unfortunate implication is inherent to the genre. It's a colonialist element, with further negative implications about pagans being essentially deservedly damned by virtue of ignorance or mistaken analysis. What really makes me cringe is the uncritical depiction of the Christian god wielding Satan as a tool to inflict cruelty in this purge of the unrighteous. I think the original story's simplicity allows for an understanding of God as a cruel master, and the traditional Jewish interrogative standpoint would not immediately dismiss criticism of the premise of God's actions being just, but mainstream American Christianity portrays God as unquestionably just, condemns interrogation of this premise, and complicates the matter by building up the figure of Satan as the origination and perpetuator of evil. When it's just God sending a flood, you have one actor, God, to agree with or not. But by replacing the flood with a second actor, Satan, we're asked to project our anger at him because he's conducting all the mayhem on Earth. The fact that God is responsible for the purge is further obscured when God sends guardian angels to combat Satan, and we associate Molly fighting Satan with the guardian angels at her back with a God-driven fight against evil. However, by keeping to the Flood narrative, Satan is ultimately blameless, just a tool wielded by God. So God is the real agent of cruelty. This could result in Old Testament true fear of God and his awesome might, but the taking leaves us with an unnuanced love of God, as is characteristic of mainstream Christianity. And it's a problematic acceptance of the unlimited use of violence by authority without accountability. Pretty relevant to the times, I'd say. This is the mindset that led to the acceptance of declaring war and ultimately killing over 100,000 people as a form of justice for the actions of 26 terrorists. Overall, it's a fun thriller, marrying signs in the mist. If you're a fan of either, or of Silent Hill, I imagine you'll get a kick out of it. Similar to an issue with adapting Silent Hill and The Ring to film, in which male protagonists were replaced with female protagonists, 
To better fit the traditional role of a loving parent, it might be a tad sexist to use a female protagonist for this specific child caretaker role, but I think Koons projects enough of himself onto the character that it becomes a respectful character depiction. Neil is also nice as the supportive husband. I just don't like the religious implications. Please like, share, subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and send me an email if you want to commission a video review, and click the link below to support me on Patreon. Pledges of $5 or more will earn you a special thank you at the end of each video. Thank you, and please check out my related videos.